and my life is like a lamp to a world that is searching for the path. We have become the example of Christ and we are now the light of the world. Can the world see the radiance of Christ in you? Evangelism does not happen by accident. Discipleship does not happen by accident. If we're going to fulfill our God-given mission as a church, we need to be intentional and reach out and share and introduce people to Jesus Christ. is an amazing continent with 50% of its population under the age of 18. If we impact the children, we would have impacted the future of the church and the future of our world. Each one of us has something to bring to the table. Are you willing to release your resources, surrendering your material goods or your gifts and talents or your time or your heart? What are you going to do? If we're going to plant the 300 churches, if we're going to reach out to a million people through evangelism, if we're going to disciple 100,000 in this nation, and if we are going to have an impact with the poor, with the needy, with children, with all the others who are part of our communities around us, it's not going to happen unless you have committed yourself to the purposes of God and you have been faithful to live by those purposes. Good afternoon. Praise the Lord. Buona sifiu sana. I'm delighted to be back here again, as Reverend Nick has mentioned. We will next week be having a commissioning service. It's going to be a commissioning where we will dedicate ourselves as marketplace ministers, as missionaries in the marketplace. So next week we'll only be having a short devotion. So this is going to be the last kind of full-length sermon. And what we are doing today, very much in continuity, in keeping with what we have just seen, the baptism where we remember or we symbolize death and resurrection, we will be talking about resurrection and seeing how to connect resurrection and our daily work. If you can put up a slide there that talks about our series. Our series has been entitled God at Work, but the subtitle has been Connecting Our Daily Work with God's Eternal Work. What do we do daily? And seeing how that connects with what God is doing throughout His eternity. I'd like us to look at some scriptures. If you can start with the passage in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll be looking at three of the key references in the Bible that talk about the resurrection. Talk about the resurrection. So we'll, talk, we'll start with, with 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll be reading verse 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. This says... The following, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always gives you, give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I was a disciple as a young Christian and taught that any time you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to ask, what is that therefore there for? 
and that is something I hope that we can find out today. This very important verse, talking about the resurrection. This is at the end of one of the greatest chapters in all of Scripture about the resurrection. Paul talks about the therefore, and you'll find out what that therefore is there for. Our second reference, again, a very important passage on the resurrection is in Romans 8. Romans 8. And we'll be reading from verse 18. 18 to 25. Romans 8, 18 to 25. I consider that our present sufferings our present sufferings are, worth, are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have, been, who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And our final text is in the book of Revelation. So we turn to the end of Revelation, Revelation 21. Revelation 21, and we will be reading the first three verses. This is the passage on the new heaven and the new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Those are the three texts we will be looking at. And we're looking here at how our daily work connects with God's eternal work. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is actually dealing with a heresy in the city of Corinth, where many people did not believe that there would be a physical resurrection. They believed that, you know, we might have some kind of revival in our spirits. It would only be a spiritual sense. And Paul was trying to tell them, my dear brothers, that is not true. I want you to understand something significant, that your whole faith rests on the truth of the resurrection. That take away the resurrection, he says this earlier in the passage, it's a long passage, we didn't have the time to read it, but he says, take away the resurrection and your faith is in vain or your faith is useless. He says, if there's no resurrection, we who have been preaching the resurrection of Christ have, pro ha have become liars. And he says that you are still then, if there's no resurrection, you are still in your sins. Basically saying, pack up Go home, do something better with your lives. If there is no resurrection, the whole Christian enterprise falls apart. But he goes on to say, my friends, Christ has indeed been raised. That the resurrection is in fact true. And he goes on to point out something important about the resurrection. And we'll be getting to that. But before we see what the resurrection is, let us understand what the resurrection is not. And the Apostle Paul also does this in this, in this passage. He says, the resurrection, first of all, is not a resuscitation. That this was not 
a question of Christ kind of being bruised and battered on the cross, and then he goes into the cool grave, and because there was a cool air and it was very, you know, they put some spices and herbs on him, he somehow got revitalized. He says this for several reasons. First of all, if you look at the faith of the new believers, they didn't look like they were following a man who came out limping out of a tomb, almost needing like he needed to go into the ICU, requiring months or weeks of therapy and care. They saw someone who came out thoroughly, thoroughly transformed. It is also important to realize why Paul says the resurrection was not a resuscitation. He says again in that passage that remember, I want you to remember that Christ died, that the death of Christ was very important. The death of Christ is significant because unless there is death, unless there is shedding of sins, the Bible says there is no, a shedding of blood, the Bible says there is no forgiveness of sins. In the Old Testament, we'd have a perfect lamb without spot or blemish being sacrificed and laid on the altar. It had to die, and the shedding of blood forgave the sins of the people. Here we're told that Christ was the perfect lamb. He had to die, otherwise there would have been no forgiveness of sins. And those Roman executioners knew their job. So Christ died, and because he died, the sin debt we had with God was fully paid. So Christ died. Also, this was not a reincarnation. This was not a question of Christ because he lived a good life, moving on to something that was higher and better, and then one day he eventually, as some of the Eastern religions believe, disappears into nothingness, that his body kind of disappears, it kind of merges into the great unknown, so-called nirvana, and he gets absorbed into the rest of nature. Paul says the physical, bodily, Resurrection of Christ is vitally important. Not only was this not a resuscitation, not only was this not a reincarnation, it was physical, bodily resurrection. And Paul then goes on to show us here why the resurrection is important. In 1 Corinthians 5, we're told that there was, in fact, a divine transaction that he who had no sin, Jesus Christ, became sin on our behalf. All our sins were laid on him so that we who are under the curse could actually inherit the blessing and become right with God. That is a divine or a cosmic transaction. What happened after this transaction? Two things. There was proof of the transaction or a receipt. And there was also, in this case, a deposit or a down payment of something even greater to follow. Proof of the transaction of the death of Christ and the fact that God's, fully, um, um, God's um, sin debt had fully been paid was the resurrection of Christ. That is the proof, the fact that Christ rose from the dead. And we see in this passage in uh, verse 54, God, uh, the, the apostle Paul says, O oh, grave, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Christ overcame death. He defeated the power of the grave. So that transaction gives proof of payment. Our debt sin is paid in full, but it is also a deposit. A deposit, the apostle tells us of three things. He tells the Corinthians here that because Christ was raised, you too are going to be raised. This was a down payment of something more glorious going to happen, that Christ's resurrection was certain. It is as certain as your resurrection will one day be. It is a down payment. It is a deposit, and God is going to come and finish the deal. But secondly, we saw this passage in Romans 8, that not only is this a down payment or a deposit for our bodily resurrection, it is a deposit for the resurrection of all of creation. All of the created order 
is also going to be raised. The Apostle Paul there in Romans talks about beauty of nature and creation. Anytime you go to a beautiful field or a beautiful mountain or anything and you see, it's so majestic, so glorious. Paul says it's only a shadow of what it one day will be. He says even that beautiful creation is kind of in prison. He's saying it's kind of held back, waiting for one day to burst forth in all its beauty and splendor and glory. And that is the other deposit that God is saying, uh, 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 Paul is saying is going to happen. So it's a deposit and proof of our body resurrection. It is a proof and deposit of the resurrection of all creation. But here is what I find utterly astonishing, that Paul ends this glorious chapter on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He ends it by saying that this is a deposit not only on, on our own resurrection for our bodies, it is a deposit on the resurrection of all of creation. But in verse 15, 58, chapter 15, verse 58, it says, it is also a deposit for the resurrection of our work. I find it utterly astonishing that Paul connects this glorious future we have, this glorious resurrected future we have with everyday ordinary work. And he says, therefore, in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and this is what this therefore is therefore, since all these things you've heard before, the resurrection of our body, the resurrection of creation is one day going to happen. It is as certain as the certainty of Christ's physical resurrection. resurrection. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, therefore, work. It's an amazing conclusion. He says, therefore, work. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that your work in the Lord is not in vain. An amazing conclusion that the Apostle Paul is giving us. There's so much happening in this verse, chapter 15, verse 58. Let's just try and unpack it a bit. First of all, he talks about the brothers and sisters. He says, therefore, dear brethren, or brothers and sisters, he is talking here about people who are in the faith. That means what? They have accepted the finished work of Christ on the cross. Here are not people trying to work out their own salvation. Here are people who have accepted that it is only the blood of Christ that can purchase their salvation. In simple words, they are saved. And to be saved is to accept the finished work of Christ and accept that we have got no way through our own merit of earning Christ's or God's forgiveness. This is the gift of grace, as we're told in Ephesians um, chapter 2. It is a gift. It is not something that we do. It is not by law. It is something that God gives us by grace. Law says do. Grace says done. Grace says it is finished. Law says you must finish it. And there is nothing you can do to perfect your um, entry into God's kingdom. Grace says Christ has come down. Law says we must try up. You hear these stories about, oh, it doesn't matter. You can climb up the different sides of the mountain. We're all leading up to the same. There's one God at the top. It doesn't matter which side of the mountain you go up to. We all end up at the top, and it's the same God. Who told you in the first place that we're climbing up mountains? The Bible says Christ came down. Emmanuel, God, with us. He's already here. He's revealed himself. We don't need to climb up anywhere. It's not through our own merit. It is by grace, in the beautiful words of the reformers. Salvation is earned only in, can be given to us only in one way. We're saved how? By grace and by grace alone. Through faith and through faith alone. In Christ and in Christ alone. Someone say amen. amen. That is the only way we are accepted by God. So this is about believers. It is written to brethren. But then he says, stand firm. He's talking about being steadfast. Keep your eyes on the prize. Don't be double-minded. Keep focused. Keep focused about this glorious gift that you've been told. Stand firm. He goes on to say, let, um, and, and let nothing move, move you. Always give yourselves 
fully to the work of the Lord. Some other translations say always abounding in the work of the Lord. This is about being productive in everything we do. Always being productive. Remember where we started in Genesis 1. We said that Adam was given the mandate of production. He was put in the earth on the, on, 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 um, in Eden, in the world, Genesis 2.15, to do what? To work it, to cultivate it, and take care of it. Always be productive. We talked about his job being translating culture in uh, nature into culture, making culture out of nature, being productive. The Apostle Paul says here, always abound, not just working half-heartedly, but giving yourself fully, wholeheartedly to what? He goes on to say, to the work of the Lord. Well, I think that's something we have learned in this series, that what is the work of the Lord? We saw this in week two. All good work done well is God's work. We saw that there is no spiritual or secular divide. The only divide God recognizes is between the sacred and the sinful. No spiritual or secular and sacred divide. There is also no part-time and full-time divide. If you say, I only serve God part-time, you need to ask who you're serving the rest of the time. We are full-time servants of God in the marketplace, full-time servants of God in everything that we do. But the Apostle Paul here is also telling us there is no temporal or eternal divide because it goes on to say that nothing you do, all of your labor is not in vain. It's not useless. He's trying to say here that everything we do in the here and now has impact and translates carries on into eternity. There's something that we need to understand about the message Paul is giving. He is telling us that your work here and now carries through to eternity. Why? I want us to understand something about time and eternity. Everyone say time. Eternity. Time is a different slice or segment which we as human beings live within. We say, I'm coming at this time. This is the time for me to start or to stop something. We talk about seasons. We talk about the amount of time we have for a certain project. Time is boundaries or seasons or the limits that God has given us. And our earth, our time on earth is also limited. We've got limited time. God, however, is outside of time, and his span is eternity. The Apostle Paul is saying that as far as God is concerned, if you're working faithfully within his time or within one of the segments of what we call time, as far as God is concerned, it's all within his, inter- his eternity. So you have been faithful in time. God says, Within his eternity, you have been faithful. What you did at one point in time for God, he's looking at eternity. And all things within his eternity have purpose. You did something in time for God, it's purposeful because it was within his eternity. There is nothing in scripture that tells us that what you do at one point of time is more important than another point of time. As there's nothing in scripture that shows One kind of work is more important than another kind of work. We do work faithfully for God in time, and that work, though we call it time, is within God's eternity. And when God is doing the evaluation, he says, within his eternity, which is breaking down the boundaries of time, you have been faithful. And secondly, we are told that we are servants. We are meant to be serving God others and service-oriented. This is what we saw in another week when we looked at Matthew 25. And we saw that Jesus says here in that great chapter in Matthew 25 that whatever you did for the least of these, you did unto me. Anything we have done within time for anyone who is made in God's image, anyone made in God's image for God is important. Anything we've done to bless, to help, to assist, 
anyone made in God's image was faithfulness within time, but also within God's eternity. And for God, that counts. Whether it was something spiritual or something material, as long as it was good work, done well, God says, that was my work. Remembering what we saw in Colossians 3.23, that's our ultimate master. Our ultimate boss is who? God himself. So within time, the time segments we have are just simple slices of God's eternity. And for God, all of that matters. We have been faithful within his eternity. There's a beautiful passage in Revelations 14, 13. It says, blessed are those then who die in the Lord. They shall rest from their labor and their good works will follow them. Their good works will follow them. There is transition what we're doing from this world into the other. For us, it's a different segment of time. As far as God is concerned, it's all within his eternity. Their good works will follow them. There is nothing we're doing that is in vain. What does this mean about our future? There are a few things I want us to see clearly about what Paul is saying here. He's telling us that work is something God put Adam in the Garden of Eden to do. He was put in the Garden of Eden to work it. We saw in John 5, 17, when Jesus healed someone um, in the temple on a Sunday and he was criticized, he said this amazing statement. He said, my father is still working to this very day, and so am I. God hasn't gone on a long vacation and put up his feet after he finished the, his creation project. His father, Jesus' father, God the father is still working, and so is Jesus. Adam worked in the Garden of Eden. Jesus and God the Father are still working. We are working now at a different segment or slice of, slice of God's time. It's very interesting to see that in the age to come, what we call the future, the age to come, still part of God's eternity, we are also going to be working. Revelations 22 and verse 3. Revelations 22 and verse 3. It's talking about the New Jerusalem, the heavenly city. And it says something important about us who are described as servants. We're told in that passage that we, his servants, shall serve him. Work was there in the garden. Work is there here. Work will continue in the New Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul is saying essentially this. If work was part of paradise, which is what we saw in week one, we can fully expect work to be part of paradise restored. We saw that work was something that is in the very heart and character of God. It was God Elohim, the God creator God, the God who works, who is above everything that he created, who is the one who first worked. If work was part of paradise, work will be part of paradise restored. There's something else we would need to understand about work in the age to come. God's promise is not to make all new things. God's promise in Revelation 21 is all things new. And there is a world of difference. He's not going to take the things that he made, get rid of them, and make something entirely new. God's promise is all things new. This is what we said in week one. God does not make trash, and God does not trash what he's made. Let's say that together. God does not make trash, and God does not trash what he's made. This creation God made is not going to be destroyed and made, thrown into the dustbin of eternity. It's going to be thoroughly renewed, restored. And I'd just like us to see the most powerful passage about this in the New Jerusalem. It's what we saw in Revelations 21. So if you can look at that again in Revelations 21, those first three passages. Revelations 21 tells us something about the New Jerusalem. I 
um, if you can, let, let's do Revelation 21, verse, verse 1 to 3. Let's do 1 to 3. Verses 1 to 3 in Revelation 21 says something important. Therefore, then I saw, this is John looking out into the future, the, the vision that the Apostle, John, um, the Apostle John has about the future. Then he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, prepared as a bride, fully dressed from her husband. Surprise! The new Jerusalem is coming down, not going up. We all thought that, what is God's plan? After we finish in this world, he gets it together, puts us in this heavenly spaceship, we all book our tickets, ready to fly off, and then we turn around, he says, hang on a minute, and then he explodes his divine dynamite, boom, and you see the greatest firework display that there ever was, and you wish goodbye to the world, and we fly off to this unknown place we call, you know, our future. God says, surprise, the new Jerusalem is coming down to purify, to renew, to redeem this world. All things new. Remember what Paul is talking about here in the resurrection. He's saying that there is something unfinished about us when we die. When we die, the Bible is clear. We are absent from the body and we are present with the Lord. There is no limbo. There is no waiting room. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We don't pray for people after they're dead. There's no limbo and you pray for them. It depends then on how much you pray, whether they go left or right. No. It is absent from the body, present with the Lord. However, there is some unfinished business. It was never God's plan to have spirits, inanimate, um, separated from their bodies, and our bodies which he made, and the beautiful bodies that he gave us, perfectly suited for this earth that has been fine-tuned for his creation, rotting in the ground. This is why the Apostle Paul says, the physical bodily resurrection of Christ, which is the deposit for the bodily resurrection of all of us, is significant. That God is going to reunite our spirits and our bodies and give us a habitation in the new heavens and the new earth. And we will continue serving and working for him. And it's very interesting to see what it goes on to say in that passage in Revelation 21. It says four times that not only is this new Jerusalem and this new city going to be our dwelling place, but there is something that is significant even beyond that, that God himself, that the Son of God himself will dwell with us. He says that in several places. He says that um, time again. He says and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will live with them. Look, God's habitation or God's dwelling is now with man. The greatest thing about the new heavens and the new earth, my friends, is that we will continue not only to serve God, but we'll be living in his presence, and we will see him face to face. There are several things we need to know that are uniting the past and the present. The garden in Eden and the new Jerusalem and the new heavens. The garden of Eden was the perfect habitation God gave us as humans. Psalm 115 verse 16. Psalm 115 verse 16. A key verse. The highest heavens belong to God, but the earth but the earth he has given to mankind. That the earth was perfectly fine-tuned for our own existence. And God's perfect plan was man living in paradise, in fellowship with one another and in harmony with creation, in fellowship particularly with him, and doing what? Serving him through our work and our worship. There's a very good similarity between what is in the garden and what is in the new Jerusalem. What do we see in the new heavens and the new earth? We see man in the new heavens, in the new earth. In our resurrected bodies, 
working for God as we've seen, serving him, and in fellowship with one another, in harmony with our creation, and most importantly, in fellowship and in presence and in harmony with Jesus Christ himself. This is all things new. Nothing we ever do is in vain. Nothing we ever do is useless. So we need to see a few practical points here and understand what are the applications of what this means. We need, first of all, to appreciate that we should be service-oriented. This is what we'll be talking about in our devotion next week, so I don't want to spend too much time on that, that we should be service-oriented. We are servants. And serving others, that customer you think is a customer, is actually an opportunity for you to do the works of God and to minister to God through that person. Jesus said, what you gave to the least of these, you gave to me. That person you call the client is actually someone masquerading as a client. It is actually Christ himself, and it's an opportunity to love God by loving others. So that's a more of that next week. But we need also to see how we set our priorities. We need to revise, for instance, what we human beings have come to call our bucket lists. I don't know how many of you have got bucket lists and how far you've gone down your bucket list. You know, all those weird and wonderful things you want to do before you kick the bucket, so to speak. And I know that many of you think that, you know what? I must do certain things and I must do them now because I'm going to kick the bucket and this world is all I have. We need to remember one of the biggest lies of the, the devil, and it is this. You must have everything. You must have it now. And it does not matter how. It's a lie from the pit of heaven, of hell. Sorry, a lie from the pit of hell. There is no concern the devil shows here in his mind for eternity. The devil's biggest lie is this, is to make time more important, more attractive than eternity. He wants us to live only for this world. Get everything you want. That crooked business deal, get it. That illicit affair, get it and enjoy all the pleasures. Get it now, by fair means or foul. Get it now. Why? This world is all you have. You only go around once, so you better enjoy the ride. The Bible, my friends, does not say you will die full stop. The Bible says you will die, comma, and then comes judgment. The devil conveniently edits out the end and then. Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto man once to die, and then comes judgment. The devil edits out the and then. This world is all you've got. Get it. Get it now. It doesn't matter how. Live for the present. Forget about the future. In other words, take your eyes off eternity. We need to appreciate that no matter how long we live in this world, it is just a small speck, a tiny segment of God's eternity. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3, he has put eternity in the hearts of man. You are really longing for eternity. And the things we do in the here and now, the things we do in our daily workplace through blessing and ministering these other people have impact through eternity. If you think that your bucket list is too long or your bucket list is not creative enough, I mean, I know Kenya is a beautiful country, and I don't know what your bucket list is about in Kenya. Maybe skydiving in Diani. Maybe paragliding off Kerio Valley. Those of you who are into adventure tourism. Maybe that cruise to some beautiful place, the Bahamas or the Antarctic. You really are into adventure. And the devil is trying to say, you know what? By fair means or foul, go for that adventure. If you can get things off your bucket list, good for you. But don't break the rules in order to do it.
The Bible tells us about some great adventure tourism that we are going to experience in the future. And it says this, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has the mind of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Your best life is not now, as some would have you believe. Your best life is yet to come. By all means, enjoy your bucket lists. But boy, I can tell you that cruise, that trip, that paragliding will be 10 times better, 10 times more scenic once the earth has been renewed and restored, as we're told in Romans. I mean, you guys are thinking about paragliding. One of the things I'm looking to is not only astro-tourism in the new heavens and the new earth, but actually, you know, galactic tourism. God, or Jesus Christ himself, taking me through a tour through the spaces and through every... You know, the, the scientists tell us there are 100 billion, billion, not stars, but galaxies. Galaxies is, you know, so we've got each of those are solar systems. 100 billion, and the reason they say there are only 100 billion is because that is only as far as our, our technology can see. Our telescopes can't see any further. There could be many more. Imagine 100 billion galaxies. I want to go on a guided tour of that with the tour guide being none other than Jesus Christ, who was there at the creation. Imagine this is the God who says he knows the stars by name. That is the God we're working for. So we need to be people who are service-oriented. We need to revise our bucket list. And I'm not saying, you know, don't have your adventure, please have it, but please don't do anything illegal or corrupt in order to experience something that is only a shadow of what it one day will be. Please remember that the work we do in the here and now counts for eternity. That there is continuity between the present and the future. We're serving him now, we're serving him, we served him in the past, and we'll serve him in the future. We need to also keep working, remembering that our Father is working to this very day with us. So those of you in the six different sectors of society, if you are in the creative arts um, sector, those doing design, fashion, beauty. Give us creative content for us to fill our minds with. You are the people who have the awesome privilege of working in the same field of the Creator God. He was the Creator, the God Elohim who first created. You should use your creative genius to fill this world with beauty and songs and content that is inspiring. Those of you who are in the business, entrepreneurship, commerce, and manufacturing sector, work as unto the Lord. Remember what we saw last week, that beautiful example we gave of Job, who was an entrepreneur, who was a gifted and a wealthy business person, and God said he was righteous. There was none like him in the whole world. Let him be your model. Remember what we said in week two, that the son of man himself spent most of his life running a small business in that carpenter shop in Nazareth. And what we said then is worth repeating now, that if you're running a small business, you're in divine company. Someone say amen. Those of you in the education and family sector, remember that your schools are not only shaping the minds, but also the character of people. Remember that you have a privilege, unique privilege, unique privilege of working when people's minds are still soft and supple and can be shaped. Also, do that as unto the Lord. It is not in vain. Keep pressing on. I know sometimes there's so much frustration in what we do. There's so much unfinished business in our project. We look at our work and we wonder what will ever become of it. God is saying keep pressing on. Those of us also um, in the education, it also talks about the family. And we should remember that our families do not thrive by accident. We need to be spending time with our families. You are a father. If you're a father and you want to change the world, here's how to start. Go home and be a great dad. Someone say amen. There is no headhunter who can headhunt for an alternative father to your children. They can headhunt for your job as director or CEO. Go home. Start with impacting those lives. Be a great dad. Be a great mom. 
Remember, fatherhood, our parenthood is something we get from the heart of God. Those of you in the sector of governance, politics, and justice, remember that God himself describes himself as the righteous judge. Justice and righteousness, as we saw, are the foundations of God's throne. What a privilege to work in that sector. Keep working. Your father is still working. What you do is not in vain. Those of you in the science and technology area and also doing engineering or medicine, give us innovative ideas which solve our problems. Give us innovative solutions to the world's problems and help us come up with technology that is a blessing. And those of you in medicine, you are working in the same profession as the great physician. Though our bodies will decay, as we have seen today, our bodies one day will have a resurrected glorious future. And what you do partially now, God will one day complete. Keep working and work at it with all your heart. I'd like to acknowledge that there is a group we need to be sensitive to. And these are the people without jobs. The people who may be seeking work. Or the people who may be in between jobs. And we need to pray and be sensitive to you. The work you may have to do now is that of seeking a job, or even volunteering and giving of your time and your skills. But remember that God values your talent, and your situation of joblessness is not the way God defines you. That's a temporary thing that will pass. But find ways of using your skill, even if it is unpaid, to bless. We haven't said much in this series, and that's been intentional, about another key sector, the last sector, which is church and religion. And it's been intentional because we really wanted to see what the marketplace is about and to see how we as Christians in the marketplace can practically apply our faith. But let me just say one or two things to us who have the privilege of being in Nairobi Chapel, that we should appreciate that this is a church that has decided by God's grace and also through the wisdom of its leadership and the faithfulness of its leadership to lead and do their work of pastoring us as unto the Lord. And don't get me started on this, but then this I don't think is something that is common in this country or elsewhere. As I said, don't get me started. So I think we should have the same spirit and reciprocate that faith. Let us make the work of our pastoral team a joy and a delight. Let us pray for them and cover them in prayer. Let us be people who don't give. The Bible does not teach giving. The Bible teaches giving generously. That's the only model in the Bible. Let us give generously. Stingy giving is not in the Bible. The Bible teaches giving generously. Let us give generously to the work of the church. Let us volunteer of our time so that they have people to run the church ministry programs so that this church can grow as well. And remember that it is about the church that the Bible says not even the gates of hell shall prevail against it. So let us be people who press on. Let us never give up. Let us remember that our work carries on into eternity. It is part of God's eternity, and to him, every small deed counts. I'd like to end with a poem and a prayer, and then we'll be done. This is a poem from a bishop in El Salvador who was a great social reformer. And he talked about us always engaging, but doing this by having the long view. He talked about us not just being limited to time, but looking through eternity. And I want us to see here how he brings out the importance, the significance of what we do now and how that happens in eternity. And also, not being frustrated because what we do is not complete or what we do is not perfect. This side of heaven, there's going to be frustration in our work. But he says that we should do it remembering there's someone who will take what we've done and perfected it. And this is the uh, late Bishop Oscar Romero. This is a poem called The Long View. And listen carefully to these powerful words. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is another way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. 
No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes all of the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives can include everything. We cannot do everything, and there's a sense of freedom in this, for it enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter in and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker or the servant. We are workers, not master builders. Ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. Let's pray. I want as we pray to just give an opportunity to someone who is out here. Our whole series has been about God at work. And we're really making a mockery of God being at work if we have not even accepted the finished work of Christ on the cross. So I'd like to ask if there's anyone out here who is not yet saved, who has not accepted Christ's finished work on the cross, just put up your hand, put up your hand, and we'd like to pray for you. And I'd like you to come forward. Just put up your hand. If you're saying today, I'd like to accept Christ's finished work on the cross. I've never done this before, and I'd like to accept that work. Just put up your hand. Now put up that hand and we'll pray for you. Father, I pray for those hands that are raised and I pray that you, Father, would just redeem, renew, and restore. Forgive their past. And we pray that through the finished work of Christ, you would make a new creation out of them. I'm asking that those who put up their hands would come to the front and meet to the prayer counselors after this. But as we continue in prayer, I'd like to invite all of us to stand. I'd like all of us to stand. And as we conclude and continue in prayer, let me ask that we stretch out our hands before us. Stretch out our hands before us and say these words of prayer after me. Dear Lord, knowing that everything I do as unto you is never in vain, and fully assured that my good works will follow me. By your grace and by your strength, I will do all the good I can in all the ways I can, with all the strength I can, by all the means I can, to all the people I can, for as long as ever I can. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen, amen and amen. God bless you. Have a, a wonderful week, and may the Lord mightily bless the work of your hands.